located in the Central Valley of California. The Fresno Fire Department. Established in 1877, the Fresno Fire Department is one of the oldest departments in the United States, rich in history and tradition. Today on the battalion, we are back at Station 3. Captain Palmer, along with firefighters Chris Garcia, Matt Silva, and traveler Dave Ramirez, take some morning time to test some of the equipment. Engine 3 is the first engine company to get their new MSA SCBAs. Can you still hear me okay? Yeah, they... They're, I mean, they're way clearer than our old ones were just without anything on them. <laughs> yeah, I'm still waiting for that first fire so I can break mine in. Yeah. I'm just kind of... I was off the last two days, so... Uh, haven't had one yet with them. Yeah. It's going to break the ice on that one and it should be good after that, you know? Nice and smooth. You haven't had one at all? Yeah. No, no, I haven't had any fires with that. Uh, Fernandez said that he broke his in on that homeless campfire that they had there, I think, last week. First morning at 7 a.m., I guess, during shift change or something. Oh, yeah, that is. How do we call? Sue. Yeah, we'll see you, my name is David Ramirez. I'm a vacation relief firefighter for the City of Fresno Fire Department and I've been on the job for six years. I became a firefighter because I decided during my college career that I didn't want to be sitting behind a desk pushing a pencil. I uh, recall as I was transferring to the local state university, one of my high school classmates, he was on lunch break from the fire academy with his fellow fire academy cadets. And as they approached me, they were looking sharp. They were in their uniforms. They had a sense of camaraderie about them and I decided I wanted to be a part of that. I wanted to be part of something bigger than just myself. Being one of the busiest engine companies in Fresno, the crew gets to the market to shop for their chow for the next 48 hours and hope that a call does not come in. That's a good one, dude. Dave's doing this. Because you're just chilling with the crush. Yeah. <laughs> just chill with my crush. Shopping with my crush. All right, man. Oh, yeah. Sure, man. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They make it back to the engine. So far, so good. Back at the station, they even get time to put the chow away. What? Okay. That's a regular touch. Let's give you some soup then. For lunch, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll be there to. You'll keep tomorrow on the top stuff with that. You run that top stuff? What? It, it, it doesn't matter to me. Tots or soup? With corn with chili dogs? Yeah. Tots, dude. What's wrong with you? I don't know, man. It's not like you need cornflakes with water. <laughs> Should we get a bit more Wait, with powdered milk? Two! Three and four minutes. This is your action. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah. they start preparing <laughs> breakfast. <laughs> After we graduated from our training, we uh, came here to Station 3 for a dinner with the crew uh, from Station 3. So it was pretty exciting, but also another anxiety-filled day because the people that were on duty here had been on for a while. And it was then that they gave us our station assignments. And my particular assignment was to be on Engine 4, which um, it's no longer Engine 4, but at the time it was uh, 
a really busy uh, place. The, the whole downtown area was known as the fire factory, so we knew we were going to get a lot of experience and a lot of exposure to things that happen out in the field. And they get time to sit down and eat. A very rare morning. call comes in. Engine 3 is out the door. The call comes in as a residential structure fire. One of the first incidents from Fresno County that made me feel like I was a part of that team and that I was a part of something that was inherently dangerous was a vehicle fire that had occurred on I-5 which is one of the main corridors in California. On that particular stretch of I-5, it's a dark, desolate area. It was approximately uh, midnight, and a big rig had, uh, had caught on fire. And as I'm sitting there in awe, looking at this big rig on fire and walking around it, I uh, proceeded around the front of the vehicle towards the uh, driver's side. And right then, the captain grabbed me by my collar and yanked me back. And just then, a big rig flew by at approximately 70, 80 miles an hour. And at that time, I realized that what I was doing was dangerous, but that with the proper training, I wouldn't let that happen again. When I was here at Engine 3, that was the time when uh, we deployed our, our MSA breathing apparatus. And I uh, hadn't used it yet on a fire, but the day later, we had a uh, fully involved garage fire. And the only way to make access to it was through the alley. So I pulled a, a hotline because there was a lot of flame. You gonna reach it with that? and um, a lot of exposures there and my job at that point was to make sure that there was no risk to the exposures. So I had to knock the fire down as my partner deployed the apartment lay so that way we could have more of an extensive reach if it did get into any of the nearby structures or vehicles or anything nearby. Well, it looks like we're barely reaching here. It's a detached garage, and both the garage and the fence are blazing. It doesn't look like it's locked. Before he puts water on the flames, David makes sure that his mask is on correctly. This is his first fire using his new MSA SCBA. First, they extinguish the flames of the fence in the front of the structure to gain access. See any lines down there, Matt, or no? Nothing yet. Yeah, I see some lines, but uh. No water on the. Okay. The crew of Engine 9 arrives on scene. Firefighter Romero moves in to continue hitting the fire with water. Yeah, I'm just going to go on through here, too. Okay, right there. Uh-huh. The entry door to the garage is locked. They must gain access. The fire is building inside the structure and needs to be vented. Yeah, 
With cutbacks across the nation and across this department, there's no money for new hose lines. This worn line bursts the leak. Firefighter Sharp uses his brute force in an attempt to break the lock on the steel door accessing the backyard. Firefighter Ramirez has gained access and continues through the back door and around to the yard. Hey, take them. You don't have to come in through here. We don't have to? No. Okay. All right. And you have access inside the building on the, on the south side. I said you have access to the garage. Okay. That's our secondary line. Yeah. B.C. Escobedo arrives on scene. Captain Palmer talks with the battalion chief. Yeah, I'm thinking about that debris pile on the side there, man. There's kind of blood and shit. Yeah, I advise the crews already. There was that one other time. There was that one other time. Battalion Chief Escobedo is on scene and talks with the homeowners. You guys are sorry, engine 12, engine 19? Truck 19? Engine 19. Anyways, what? PG&E e has arrived to shut down the power. Captain Palmer discusses the incident with Escobedo. Well, like I said, I, when I went and looked at it from the other side, it's, it's actually in there pretty good. It's connect, you know. Well, we'll take a look and see, but. Uh, it's not as threatening as a, it's not as scary as I thought it was. Let's give it to I think we need to spend the MS units at the time to break. Because I think he's out of breath. <laughs> I'm sitting there can I say that please? The fire is out. They are finishing up wetting the embers. Engine 3 was dispatched as part of a residential response to a structure fire. We arrived and found fire. Found fire in, the, in a detached uh, garage and uh, accessible through a uh, common alley in the back. They had to uh, take down some fences and the uh, fire was limited to the detached structure and we're currently trying to figure out cause and origin. The engine companies pack up their gear and roll their hose lines. Engine three is available and back in quarters. Ten minutes of GoPro. Ten minutes of film right there. Hold on, we'll take care of this. <laughs> Put it in your shorts. <laughs> After I did my time at Station 4, I came here to Station 3 for my last six months and continued my training, passed the one-year test, and from that point on, we became travelers. So the whole idea behind a vacation relief traveler is we fill in behind people that are on vacation or sick or that are on special assignment for anywhere from two hours to 24 hours. So during that time, I have had a lot of uh, opportunity to work on different rigs and different equipment and work with a variety of different people. A call comes in. It's a fire at the recycling processing center.
right there. Go into the south entrance, come all the way to the back. How are you doing? All right. What do you got, dude? Firefighters already on scene have wet down a lot of the garbage that's on the conveyor belt. Smoke and steam continues to rise from the trash. They start the conveyor belt and must make sure every bit of trash is drenched with water. They don't want to return to this. No, no, they want the metal catching fire. A fire in our um, waste uh, recycling plant got caught on a hot load, came through the conveyor belt and started a small fire in their machinery. And we just made sure that it didn't get into these incredibly, ridiculously large piles of waste. The crew of Engine 3 goes back into service. Later in the evening, Engine 3 gets another call. The most amount of times that I've moved in a 48 hour period would have to be about five times. So I would show up somewhere for two hours, uh, do my assignment there, um, check out the rig. Uh, clean some toilets, do some basic cleaning, and by the time I'm done, then I'm ready to go to, to my next house. So I go back to my next rig, uh, whether it's, it might be a truck, so I got to check out the truck, check all of the uh, equipment, which, which is quite a bit. I'm there for a couple hours, and then I get moved to a different rig, which at this point might be an engine. So it, it can be pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty busy, yeah, basically just traveling around, and not knowing where you're at from hour to hour, really. They are requested to park the rig out of the bus way and walk over to the patient. A worker at this facility is complaining of chest pains. So it's been going on 6 to 2 o'clock. On a scale of 1 to 10, a 10 is the worst pain you've ever felt. And one's not bad, but would you rate it right now? Captain Palmer is asking the patient about his level of pain when the ambulance arrives on scene. The paramedic and EMT pack up their patient for transport to the hospital. Engine 3 is back in service and available on the radio. Hey guys, come check this out. What's up, man? Did you guys get that email from Kobe? Yeah, a couple days ago. Yeah. Any of you guys look at this thing, this govx.com? Oh, cool. What is it? 
Is that a half off for military and EMS? Oh, 50%. Oh, that's cool. Pretty cool. Did you see all the stuff they have? Yes. That's some cool stuff. Yeah. What do you want? Watches? Sunglasses? I want knives. Knives. knives huh? you know? Kid stuff? It says up to 50% off. It's not bad. It's really good, actually. It's cool. You should check this thing out, man. Looks like there's a lot of good stuff. Yeah, man. Take a look at it. What's what the name of the website? Again? GovX. Uh, GovX.com. GovX, yeah. A call comes in for Engine 3 to go to the Fresno <laughs> Convention Center. When they arrive on scene, they find that an elevator is stuck in the convention center containing the featured act at the rap concert. The crew is led to the elevator in question. Matt, you want to hang here for a sec? Fighter Fighter Ramirez makes contact with the people inside of the elevator. Hey guys, the fire department, can you hear us? Okay, can you ask everybody to stop talking? Because the fire department is trying to communicate with you guys in there. I think you're going to be my best uh, source of communication with them. So, uh, yeah, just let them know if they don't know already that, that we have crews uh, dealing with the uh, with the elevator mechanical uh, okay. function, and they're going to try to basically uh, lower it down uh, using the, the hydraulic means. So, um, just basically hold on. Palmer Ramirez, uh, what are the keys that you're looking for? They test some elevator keys, and none of them seem to work. The police are directed to the kitchen area where the elevator is stuck. Hey, Alfred, can you hear us? Hey, everybody on channel one, can you stop radio talk, please? I want everybody off the radio. Alfred. All right, Alfred, can you hear me? Okay, how, do you know what floor you guys are on? Four feet below grade right here. I can see them, they're right here. They're, they're below us. They're, they're halfway down to the first floor. Yo. Yeah. 
The convention center faculty contacts the elevator company and requests them to send in a maintenance worker. The elevator specialist arrives and tries the regular method, but the elevator is overweight with the rap star and his entourage. The elevator specialist gets the elevator open on the floor above, and the people that were trapped inside come out joyous down the stairs and excited about right. being saved. Uh, we were dispatched for a report of a uh, person stuck in an elevator. We got to the Fresno Convention Center and there were 22 people, uh, including the band that was supposed to be performing, stuck in the elevator. Had difficulty accessing the, the trapped persons. Uh, elevator company repair tech eventually arrived and uh, he got them out. Moments after the rap artist and his entourage leave the facility, the crew receives a call for a shooting near the station. Concert goers surround the gas station. Many seem to know the victim. They arrive to a secured scene by the police. The crew quickly assess the patient that has been gunned down. The biggest eye-opening call that I recall was just the level of violence that uh, I had encountered out on the streets. The first big call was a double shooting. One was a fatality and the other one was a critical injury patient. And from that point on, I knew that this was going to be a wild ride for the rest of my career. And uh, I was all on board and was excited about it. They work closely with the ambulance crew. They're trying to package up the patient to get him to the hospital as quick as possible. They secure their patient to the gurney and place him in the ambulance. Some of the crew stay with the patient in the transport. All right, so okay. We were returning from our last uh, call at the convention center and we got dispatched to a shooting just uh, across the street from the station. We arrived uh, about a 25-year-old male with a gunshot wound to the head and one to the torso. Uh, crew of Engine 3 is down at community hospital with the patient. We're going to go pick him up. Engine 3 must go to the hospital with the ambulance to pick up their crew. Uh, in the back of the ambulance, uh, we did all we could to, uh, to help the victim. Um, we ran with a BLS airway and uh, tried to hold pressure on the side of his abdomen where he was shot and uh, transferred him to the hospital. Uh, once we put him in the, uh, brought him into the emergency room, he, uh, the, the hospital worked on him and uh, he's deceased.